Hi, you're watching Decelony, and this is episode 19 of 90s Overlooked Under Hood. Hi there. Yeah, two bands today, two albums, very different bands. And I think the only way I can really link them is to address the voices. Very different voices, very different vocal styles, very different music. Um, so I'll just get straight into it. So the first album today is Pony Express Record by Shudder to Think. Released on the 13th of September, 1994. So, Shudder to Think are yet another kind of DC area alternative rock band that kind of came up through the hardcore or post-hardcore scene of Washington, DC. Um, they formed in about 1986 or 87 and uh, had a fairly stable lineup through their formative years. So yeah, that lineup was uh, Craig Wedron on guitar and vocals, uh, Chris Matthews on second guitar, uh, Stu Hill on bass, and Mike Russell on drums. And between 1989 and about 1992, the band um, had a pretty prolific run. They were releasing an album a year, um, four albums in that space of time, the last three of which were all on Discord Records, who we've talked about in previous um, previous episodes. So those three Discord uh, era records were Ten Spot, uh, Funeral at the Movies, and Get Your Goat. And I think the interesting thing about this run is that there was a really clear sense of who Shudders to Think were in that period and what they were becoming. Um, for starters, they were they were kind of barely identifiable as hardcore, I would say, or coming from a hardcore scene. They were kind of slightly dreamy and tricky um their music was complex and kind of difficult to pin down but despite that through those three albums there was a real feeling of evolution from the band uh, they began to get more textural kind of have a bigger reach to the music and the kind of the complexity they were building into the song structures you could you could see it and feel it kind of developing being bent more aggressively to kind of mesh with Craig Wedron's quite astonishing uh, voice. So Craig had some kind of uh, operatic or classical training, I believe. Um, but basically, he had a huge kind of multiple octave range, which could go from a, like this kind of dirty, silky, breath breathy kind of purr up to these really clear, high, high, high tenors. Um, it never went into that kind of forced kind of falsetto thing that was kind of this beloved of kind of classic rock heavy metal singers but he could he could get up there with ease and down to the lowest lows anyway following that initial period in 1994 saw them being signed to a major label and recording their debut major label release um with a slightly rejigged lineup so um on second guitar they had nathan larson who's ex of the band swizz and on drums Adam Wade, uh, formerly of Jawbox. So Pony Express Record, yes, another of those kind of post-grunge major label signings. Uh, we've talked about several of them already in this series. And on this one, you could hear the band kind of leaning very heavily into kind of heavy rock influences without ever kind of tipping over into a kind of a parody or a, a kind of a cheap facsimile of like metal or rock styles. Uh, the music at this point became mo almost mind-bogglingly complex, really challenging song structures. In fact, so challenging that I, I, I know people who, on first hearing this album, just, just found it too much. Um, there's these dizzying rhythmic kind of switches. Uh, the guitars, they kind of mesh together and switch between kind of, you know, big classic kind of growly rock power chords and these kind of atonal fractured little kind of clusters and little solos would drop in and out all the time but kind of the thing that 
sticks through all this is the glue is the kind of the the backdrop to all this music is Wedrin's voice which kind of has the feeling of like a libretto a kind of a, a really odd blend of of opera and heavy rock and by that I don't want it to sound like something like Queen or you know heaven forbid like Muse um but the kind of the strange kind of dizzying uh, pacing and geometry of this music, um, it seemed to just kind of make it easier for the band to kind of sidestep these kind of stylistic pitfalls that could have had them pegged as, you know, you know, a heavy rock act or a progressive rock act. Um, they never sounded anything like that. Um, yeah. This sound is kind of initially overwhelming, but a few listens and it becomes very, very addictive. Um, you can see more within the music. The fog kind of lifts and um, yeah, you'll hear some wonderful songs. So uh, as ever, some key tracks and hit liquor. Uh, the opening track, it just slams into your face like a kind of a stuttering, malfunctioning bulldozer uh, straight within the opening seconds of the album. Um, you get these kind of jarring, pile-driving stabs of like twisty chords um, with Wedron kind of weaving and soaring over the top of this kind of staccato riffing. Um the lyrics, again, are just so jumbled, disconnected, like weird beat poetry. Wedron sings, A party of mouths, a finger fan caught ship. The case of her bones are softer than loose meat. I mean, this is almost kind of Captain Beefheart kind of territory. In fact, I think that may well be a Beefheart lift in part of that. But all through this, the the guitars, they, they jab like kind of like pizzicato kind of orchestral strings. And as the song progresses, you, you gradually get more intensity. You get feedback rising, this rhythmic kind of shift into this central section, which is like this kind of almost fugue, kind of dreamy, repetitive state. Um, yeah, this is just a, an absolutely dizzying opener. A very, very exciting rock music. And in fact, if, if I would... When I hear the phrase rock opera, I always imagine that this is this is what that meant. Um, but it never did, did it? Um, it's kind of propulsive, oddly hysterical, kind of drunk on its own kind of fumes, but but really strongly directed. And you never get the feeling that the band is kind of, you know, being indulgent or lost control. They're playing all the notes they want to. They're playing them exactly where they want to. This is very exacting music. Um, and yeah, it's very exciting music. Yeah, the track uh, Nine Fingers on You. It kind of starts up with this kind of greasy kind of rolling, almost like this kind of biker rock guitar riff. And um, then suddenly it drops into a lower gear and it ups the revs and the riff just seems to kind of get guttural and metallic. Um, Wedron is singing, girl, you got to hustle for your muscle machine. A really tough kind of lyric. Um, but then kind of the song kind of slams the brakes on it, goes into this kind of almost balletic kind of pirouette with Wedron weaving in these kind of, you know, heavenly kind of little woohoo vocals. And then it speeds off again and it crams all of this kind of dense change from one structure to another within the space of about two and a half minutes. Um, this is a very difficult album to try and explain the songs because they're all so incredibly dense. The whole album is just chock full of detail. Um, you could probably spend as long as I would normally spend talking about an album, talking about one track on this record. Uh, the track X French T-shirt. Uh, as a building block, it takes kind of the simplest couple of chords it can find and then just, just chops them, cubes them. Uh, it kind of divides these these very simple chords 
into this kind of stop start again this staccato kind of on off morse code riffing and then something kind of really odd and magical happens um midway wedron he kind of takes the song into a to an almost whisper um his vocal kind of takes a softer edge kind of almost slowing or stopping the st the song in its in its tracks and he kind of lets loose with this almost kind of james joycean kind of string of babble um and he sings the line hold back the road that goes so that the others may do what you let me in just to pour me down their mouths it sounds nonsensical but he makes it fit and the minute he makes it fit in this softer sense the guitars they sit back they sit back and then they build and they slam in you get this massive kind of plateau of big stacked guitars sustaining this single simple chord this riff with Wedron repeating the line over and over again until it fades uh, and the fade just feels like it comes too soon this is one of the great lost epic rock tracks of the 90s i can't think of another track like it um there's nothing i can really compare it to it is an amazing piece of music the pace slows through a couple of songs down to kind of a lilting comforting sense a track like no room nine kentucky again another very beautiful vocal melody you know wedron's really the the centerpiece here weaving this drama and although the song starts kind of dreamy and comforting it kind of edges at the midpoint in this kind of discordant kind of spooky nightmarish version of itself and kind of comes back out into the sunlight at the end it's a very kind of moody interesting song um yeah it's got a real place at the heart of the album the track track star towards the end it starts with this kind of gen gentle kind of odd number beat kind of riff and it kind of gives way into this kind of again this kind of almost stream of consciousness type lyric from Wedron. the guitar noise builds and builds through this section uh, collapsing into these little kind of coiling almost disappearing guitar shapes leaving just this single kind of tremolo picked guitar line you know roiling within the song and you think it's kind of reached this inertia and Wedron's kind of voice gets softer and softer and he kind of starts singing about the sound of shitty radio and then the original riff kicks back in 10 times taller 10 times bigger this huge reappearance of this odd numbered riff um Wedron sings to the future I can't imagine a worse fate I think about it all the time I did some damage um yeah they just they just so effortlessly manage this kind of epic inscrutable breath quickening feeling it's very arresting it is quite difficult but my goodness once once you dial into the kind of the the tones and the feel and the atmosphere of this album uh, you will find it very hard to kind of put it down i think this might be one for my kind of essentials list if i was going to make one it's it's an album that requires a little effort but the rewards are so so worth it so on to today's second album and i did promise you they would be very different this is pointless walks to dismal places by prolapse released at the end of october of 1994 So Prolapse formed uh, in Leicester in the UK in around about 91 or 92. Uh, Prolapse were uh, Pat Marsden, uh, David Jeffries, both on guitar, Mick Harrison on bass and Tim Pattinson on drums. But the two members who kind of 
perennially uh, took the limelight were the two singers, the two vocalists. That's Mick Derrick, or Scottish Mick as he was known, and Linda Steelyard. The band themselves claim to have formed with the intention of being the most depressing band ever. Um, and they claim that they chose the name Prolapse because they just wanted a word that was kind of ugly and undesirable, upsetting, off-putting. So that should give you some idea of, of where they were in terms of what they wanted to do with their music. And in fact, their sound, um, it clearly focuses on a kind of a, a very dark, a bleak, kind of almost gothic, kind of post-punk sound which has this very very unique air of kind of a a performative kind of chaos the band liked to improvise a lot certainly during the writing stage and they also claimed that they would just go off on tangents live on stage occasionally and you know you could see if you ever saw the band live that occasionally someone would kind of switch on and realise that something was happening. And there would be this kind of strange atmosphere around the band, an air of unpredictability. Um, yes, they were quite unique in that sense. But their sound, yeah, I think you do hear kind of traces of that kind of slightly aloof post-punk sound that borderline gothic sound of bands like, you know, Bauhaus or, or that kind of slightly cool, almost disinterested kind of experimentation of Public Image Limited. You definitely hear elements of that kind of repetitive uh, abrasiveness of uh, early fall. And there, there are even kind of hints, I think, of the kind of the, that dragged out kind of drony kind of experimentation you've got in bands like Loop. But the band sound was always kind of strongly linked to this kind of absurdist kind of improvised sense of danger being just around the corner. Um, and while the band did record other albums, I think this album, their debut album, this is the one that best captures that, that element of prolapse. Um, and I think Subsequent albums may have be been more sophisticated in some ways, but and certainly they have a lot to recommend them. But if I was going to pick one prolapse album to kind of try and describe to someone this is what the band were like, it would be Pointless Walks to Dismal Places. So let's let's look at some key tracks again. Um Headless in a Beat Motel. Again, this this opens with again this staccato morse code kind of staccato like like a like a klaxon like a siren sound of a riff which quickly kind of marshals into this racing pulsing urgent kind of drum beat um and mick comes in delivering this kind of stream of non sequitur kind of stream of consciousness you can barely decipher it. He sings in a very, or he sings, speaks in a very dense, thick kind of Glaswegian accent. But it's kind of, you know, railing against something. It sounds furious. It sounds confused. And then Linda joins him uh, during the verses, kind of egging him on, singing faster, 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 faster. And it kind of, it hits what would, almost be a chorus for a song like this although it's difficult to discern a chorus from reversing such a kind of a stripped down song but they sing but i always end up headless in a beat motel which must surely be a reference to the coen brothers film uh barton fink i would imagine it's just this kind of thrilling kind of you know hold on tight rattling kind of rocket ride of a song it just cruises this single chord for the entirety of its length it's just threatening to derail itself and just 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 run off the rails um all the way through it uh yeah it's a it's a great song so there are several tracks where kind of mick and linda took kind of separate uh turns um where they would take a lead vocal basically 
on uh, Surreal Madrid, uh, Mick takes the lead with this tale of uh, Jesus Jill and his crazy kind of turbulent leadership of the Atletico Madrid football team during the 80s and 90s. Um, yeah, it's just this slithering, seesawing, two-chord melody that just kind of backs the whole song with this kind of raving, raging, mad story being delivered by Mick in his thick Scottish accent. He never, he never, you know, dialed that back in any way. On a track like uh, Chill Blown, uh, Linda takes the lead vocal here and she just kind of gives this it's an almost dead kind of disconnected tone to her voice. She's outlining a lover's failings, just in unsparing kind of detail, robotic. Uh, It's a horrible kind of dissection of a failed relationship with this kind of uh, nagging guitar figure and this weird rolling drum pattern that just sounds like the kit is being thrown down a staircase. And it carries on in this vein until suddenly it accelerates and races away, gaining momentum. But Linda's voice stays kind of close and dead and flat, never falters. And she sings, I never wanted to hurt you. You never can tell which ways these things will go in the end. Um, I think Surreal Madrid and Chill Blown show both vocalists Um, at their best, with their their own style kind of given a solo spot, if you like. But there are a couple of other songs which show both vocalists kind of working together, but in in kind of drastically different ways. Um, The song Burgundy Spine, um, it starts and opens with this kind of skipping, spiralling, almost kind of um, Banshees-like guitar riff. yeah, it puts me in mind of Happy House, uh, John McGough's guitar riff from that. Um, and in fact, this is probably about as, as, as pretty or as delicate or as dreamy sounding as Prolapse ever got. Um, you get Mick kind of down low, intoning these buried kind of phrases, with Linda on top kind of more animated, describing this kind of fantastical, dreamlike, nightmarish scene of trees and animals and strange landscapes uh yeah it's it's quite a surreal and unsettling song but um yeah it's a very kind of uh woozy pretty beautiful kind of song which is kind of in stark contrast to the album closer and the song which really shows linda and mick and what they could bring together vocally this song is uh tina This is Matthew Stone. And it was a long time set closer for Prolapse when they were playing live. It's got this tumultuous kind of messy rolling fall like rhythm and the bass just kind of stabs out the whole melody. And you get Linda and Mick kind of warring. They're kind of trading vocal insults. Why don't you shut your mouth and let someone with something good to say speak? sings Linda. And it, it carries on in this way with this goading, this raging. It sounds like a massive kind of lover's argument being conducted in public, this huge musical psychodrama playing out in front of you. And the guitars get kind of increasingly psychotic and almost there's this kind of bluesy, slidey feel to the, to the central riff. And the song builds and builds and then it just seems to stop with it caught in this locked groove. But... Amazingly, the kind of the argument amongst the vocalists just continues and gets more and more uncomfortable and personal and venomous. You hear the sound of a struggle, you know, someone slapping someone, a a genuine physical struggle, yells and shrieks. This kind of boiling fury and resentment and the song just ends. But I can attest to having seen Prolapse live and that They certainly did like to needle, to goad one another into an agitated state to try and get something um, out of their performance, to add something interesting for the audience. Um, 
And I think on that track, they were trying to translate that to album. I think they did a pretty good job. In fact, I think this is a very fine album. It's a really good document of this kind of dark, feisty, provocative band. You just love the thrill of just chaos and pushing people's buttons in a live setting. Um, as I said, their other albums would get musically maybe more polished, more adventurous. But um, if I want to hear Prolapse or if I want to kind of sum up Prolapse, this is the record I put on. Uh, it's a very good album. So the end of another episode. And it's time for me to uh, ask for your contributions again. Be that coming back and watching me again or having your say below. Um, whatever you feel like doing. But I would very much appreciate it if you'd come back and join me very soon for another episode of 90s Overlooked and Heard. <laughs>